So today, we're going to expand on some of the material we saw last time with an eye towards uh, a spiral traversal through, through the material that will last for most of the term. Um, last time, in addition to course administrivia, we uh, spoke about motivations uh, for this system science lens, this sort of science of the whole that that offers uh, an integrative alternative to kind of the reductive um, process that uh, was the mainstay of, of, of science uh, for over many, many uh, decades, or at least Western science. And um, uh, this uh, integrative approach um, is really about making sense of how the pieces fit together to yield patterns for the whole. And I gave the example there of a traffic jam that, you know, you, you can't understand a traffic jam just by understanding the characteristics of each car in isolation. It's, it's about something more than that. It's, it's about their interactions um, uh, with each other. It is about some factors involving vehicles. If, if a vehicle is highly subject to breakdown, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a difference. But it's also a lot about the interaction between vehicles. It's about um, uh, interaction of a vehicle with its environment, uh, things like visibility, road conditions, et cetera. Um, and it's about things like the the width of the roadways and, and the, the sharpness of bends and um, uh, how many lanes there are and, and uh, connectivity of the broader network. So um, we deal all the time in the real world with problems that are more akin to traffic jams um, than to, you know, uh, to, to heaps of, of rice or sand. Um, uh, our problems are entangled. Um, they are uh, they're complex in a, in a, in a technical sense um, that, that has many hallmarks. Um, uh, one of them is is delayed impact um, of our changes. We undertake a change, and like steering a car on an icy road, like this morning, um, you know, we we often uh, steer too far and, and slide over, and hopefully not into the other lane, but uh, in in risk of 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 going off uh, off kilter. And sometimes we overcompensate and and shoot back the other way. There's delays associated with the response of the vehicle to our our commands. There's uh, there's feedbacks in, in in effect where you know you uh, you have more cases of an infection and people's risk perception goes up and hopefully that leads to some um, some behavioral responses that lower the risk of exposure, um, uh, often with with delays that lead to oscillations. Um, we have issues where just a small fraction of the population have a disproportionate impact. Um, and nonlinearity, which is arguably the, the single biggest effect, whereby it, you know, it's it's not enough to just say how many susceptibles are there out there in the population, and from that to to know something about how an infection will spread. Instead, you've got to ask how many infectives are there as well, um, and uh, you can't reason about a system um, behavior as a whole by taking apart into all the pieces summing up the behavior for each of those pieces and thinking you've somehow explained the behavior of the whole system, which is largely uh, how Western science operated for, for many uh, centuries with this, with this um, uh, cherished assumption that you could piece things t uh, apart, understand them, and, and piece the whole together from that. And, and it doesn't work for nonlinear systems. Um, so last time we, we gave some of these motivations and we dove into the issue of um, system science as a response to this, the science as a whole, um, that seeks to understand uh, how, this, how the whole relates to the parts in a, in a principled way. And uh, often it's motivated by the desire not just to understand, but to manage or, or, or handle or make better decisions about that whole. Um, and uh, we gave some elements of the philosophy. Look, we're, we're, a key element of this is dynamic models. These models that characterize the behavior of a system over time. But um, uh, those, those dynamic models uh, are themselves uh, not um, privileged. They're not um, guaranteed to be correct. 
it's it's not that the model is correct in some crystal ball way um it's not that you know we judge it as correct or not and throw it away if it's not um models i argued like maps are are useful precisely because they leave out detail um just like a you know a perfect map of saskatoon the only perfect map of saskatoon is is saskatoon itself and you're never going to fit that into your car or your iphone um and it's of necessity we simplify things and so as george bosch box said the famous uh, statistician all models are wrong but some are useful um but these dynamic models share certain characteristics and we're going to be talking again just a reminder of those shared characteristics what i which i went over at lightning speed last time and then we're going to talk about three major dynamic modeling traditions all of which accord with those characteristics all of which instantiate those characteristics but do so with um different modeling languages different emphasis and typically different questions that they pursue um and you'll find a lot of fairly partisan um, comparison of these where folks from one tradition, you know, talk unfavorably about those from the others. But a, a lot of that misses the point. Um, they're often judging other traditions and modeling in other traditions um, as to how it answers questions that are privileged or, or emphasized in their own tradition. Um, whereas really the, the different traditions ask different questions and um, they seek to answer different, um, different questions and, and seek to address different types of problems. Um, and it turns out that as someone who, who applies uh, in our own work, all three traditions, each of them has um, a very uh, a powerful contribution to make. In fact, a complementary uh, contribution to make. Uh, the world would be poorer without each of these. Um, and bear that in mind. Um, so we're going to be talking about each of these three traditions. And indeed, the, late, the, the latter parts of the course will go into this issue of, of complementarity. It's, it's actually not a matter of either or these traditions. Um, you can actually mix and match them where for different parts of your modeling problem, you uh, apply different traditions. Um, and you may change the boundary of what's represented in one tradition versus another um, as you learn. Because modeling, I emphasized last time, is a learning activity. These models represent learning prostheses. Um, they're like crutches or canes or artificial legs but the problems they address are not muscular skeletal in nature they're not they're not about i have a broken arm i have a broken leg whatever they're they're cognitive in nature and some fascinating experiments have been conducted by colleagues of mine at mit which which basically showed the fact that um the the most advanced science technology engineering and mathematics uh, graduate students those who have intimate knowledge of differential equations and um, and computational methods when it, when it comes to managing complex systems by intuition or, or by direct observation they perform horribly i mean it, it's just you know comedy of errors it's it's just uh, remarkable to see the shortcomings um, and you put Einstein in front of a complex system and ask him to manage it, and he's gonna he's gonna do quite a bad job too. Um, so um, these models basically help serve as as computational crutches, as it were, to to help check our thinking. And it's not that they are right; it's that they more quickly spot for us the. Um, the gaps in our thinking, the gaps in our reasoning. They more quickly spot for us the blind spots that we have. They more they more quickly underscore for us where our cherished prejudices in, in judging the situation are off base. Okay, so, so this is the role of models. Just as a recap, I know some of you weren't, uh, weren't make, uh, able to make it here last time. Okay, but enough of that you know, philosophy, overall perspective. Let's get into to, to more something getting us closer to the nitty gritty. I mentioned this is a spiral approach. This will be the view from 30,000 feet 
of the three traditions. Subsequent lectures, the next three after this, will be dealing with the view from 10,000 feet for each of these traditions, a full lecture on each tradition. All of this is designed to empower you, dear, dear viewers, in um, helping to, to give you some orientation for the broad arc of the course and for those thinking about projects to, to get you aware of, of as it were, the, the, the menu of options uh, out of which you might, you might uh, uh, build a project in terms of modeling methods. Um, and I'll be posting some, uh, some ideas for projects uh, by, by Saturday. We've got some people writing with them into me and, and I'll be posting them on the Moodle site for those looking to, uh, to find stakeholders as required. Um, but uh, the subsequent lectures, the 10,000 foot view, will also be designed to get you in short order thinking, so when you encounter a given method in more detail, and we'll be spending many uh, lectures on each method, you'll already be able to say, you know, to, to think what is this method abstracting away from? What is it leaving out? What is it glossing over? Um, and, and contrast it with some of what you've heard for, about other methods, okay? So so this is the the, the goal of, of the next bunch of lectures. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be with you through this process. And that spiral on which we're going um, uh, is, is going to continue through uh, the large majority of, of the course, okay? Um, so, so this is the plan, and um, I look forward to, um, to walking with you on this journey. Uh, okay, so, so let's dive into some elements. I'm going to share my screen uh, so that you don't have to suffer any longer, dear viewers, the indignity of my visage. Okay, so um, there we go. Um, Okay, so out of the frying pan into the fly into the fire because now you'll have to suffer, dear viewers, the indignity of my slides. Um, okay, um, so uh, uh, here um, I, I'm going to be providing this brief overview of dynamic modeling approaches. Um, just as a reminder, we're going to go through these initial slides very quickly because we did touch on them last time. Look, dynamic models seek to help us better understand systems, but critically better manage complex systems. Um, and uh, they, in order to do so, particularly the latter, to address what if questions, where we're talking about situations that have never previously been experienced, where we don't have data about what happens because it hasn't happened those sorts of situations to reason about it we need the model to posit some sort of causal relationship how a influences b and how b influences c so you know how does how does the occurrence of infection lead to subsequent um uh, the likelihood of someone subsequently needing hospital care for covid we need we need some sort of causal chain by which one thing kicks off another kicks off another how does, how does infection then lead to some probability of transmitting to others? How does it lead to some symptoms? How do those symptoms develop and with what sort of delay to lead to presentation to hospital? And, and dynamic models, we're talking about dynamic models here, um, provide a way of, of examining these consequences um, of one area of the system all around it. Uh, one of the other hallmarks of these systems I didn't mention this morning is you poke it one place at it reacts all across it, right? So um, if, you, if you start trying to find people, uh, you open a drive-through testing site for infection, that's gonna end up rippling through to the number of people coming into hospital for elective surgery who are, are undiagnosed COVID infectives because you reduce the number of undiagnosed people. It's gonna affect the number of people coming into emergency rooms. Um, it's gonna ripple through to um, you know the the number of uh, kids in school who may be um, uh, infecting classmates or what have you. Um, models help us uh, to 
to sort of reason about a system, identify vulnerability, identify points where we can really make a difference so we don't bang our head against the wall, as I spoke about proverbially last time, not working against the nature of things like poor old King Canute. Um, they identify ways of fruitfully changing the system structure and improve ways of coordinating within systems, which is often a, a key thing because in today's large systems, I can assure you in our health system, um, you get the left hand sometimes not knowing what the right hand is doing. Um, so the key thing, though, I, I want to talk about today is that, look, um, these dynamic models, they depict the behavior of a system over time. Um, you, for these complex systems, you can't say over time exactly what it's going to do. You can't say it's going to behave you know, the number of infected people is going to oscillate like a sine wave, um, you know, based on the season plus, um, you know, factors related to um, the number of people infected. You can't write down a so-called closed form solution, a formula, an expression that, that tells us. Instead, um, th with nonlinear systems, we have to simulate it to understand its behavior over time in general. And in order to do that, the model represents an evolving state, an underlying situation over the time. So one way that people have expressed um, dynamic models are, these are models where what can happen n next depends on what's the current situation. Um, so what may be going forward depends on the what is now, okay? Um, that's in contrast to a system where, you know, every minute, for example, dice are being rolled and, and different things occur just based on that. Those, don't, those aren't depending on the past history. They're independent of that past history. But this is something where they depend on the past history. That's one of the features of dynamic modeling. Um, the possibilities in, in the next little bit depend, hinge on what is the case now. And in order to characterize this, all these modeling traditions, all three of them, they specify incremental changes um, for what might happen the next little bit given the current situation. So that, that incremental change is not independent of what is the case now. Nobody's going to get infected if there ain't any infectives to, to infect them. Um, nobody's going to get infected if there are no susceptibles. Um, to get infected. If everyone's already infected, nobody's going to get infected. Those are cases where what happens in the next little bit depends on the current situation. And here, the system behavior is emergent. It's, it's something which comes out of this bubbling set of interactions of, entangled, of the entangled system. Um, and generally, these are nonlinear non components. Now, one thing that you should be aware of up front for all three of these traditions, and I'm emphasizing commonalities here, is there's this common question for any tradition, discrete event simulation, system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling. There's an issue about model scope. And there's basically three ways that phenomena in the world might relate to our model. One thing is that the model actually, for, for some behavior, maybe it's number of people coming in to the hospital over time who are you know, reporting shortness of breath or, or high fever. Um, the model could endogenously calculate it. It could, it could generate that. It could try to explain it by generating it. And indeed, there's this whole notion of uh, the generativist manifesto and, and, and generativist perspective on science. It says, really, look, you don't really understand a phenomena unless you can generate it without presupposing it. Um, unless you can create a model that that gives rise to it without hardwiring the assumption of it in there, you haven't really understood it. Unless you can generate it from from other things, these are things called endogenous in models. They they're calculated by the model. If you want to think about it more mechanistically, um, that's one set of things. These are, by the way, great sets of things to know for the final exam, or I might add for pop quizzes. Um, another set of things are exogenous things. These, these are things represented in the model. Endogenous things are. Th these ones are as well. 
But the model's not calculating them. Endogenous things, the model tells to us. We, it's generated from other stuff in the model over time. Um, the number of susceptibles and infectives in the underlying population and uh, tells us ultimately how many people might come into the hospital sick with COVID. Um, but uh, that's for endogenous. Exogenous things we tell to the model. We say, assume this amount of vaccine available in each subsequent month uh, for Saskatoon or each subsequent week. We're doing that right now, by the way, uh, for our health system. And um, we just tell that to the model and say, go figure. It's represented in the model. The model has it in it, but we're it's not generating it. It's using it as an assumption, okay? Um, uh, we might say, you know, assume this level of testing going forward or this lab capacity going forward, um, uh, this, uh, this ability to handle contact tracing volumes um, uh, or, or this uh, level of um, speed in, in following people up who are diagnosed as infected to find their contacts. Those would be ex exogenous. Um, and the model takes them into account, but it's not generating them. We're telling it to it. It's an assumption. The final thing is, look, all models are simplification. The map you use to navigate Saskatoon on with Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever, um, or that paper map uh, tag, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, ragged in your car, um, um, that leaves out all sorts of details, the placement of fire hydrants and crosswalks and you know, where the street lights are and how many lights there are at each place, etc. Those are ignored. Those are ignored for the sake of this model. And they're generally ignored because we don't think they have a really big bearing on the results. We think they are ignorable for our question to which this model has been built. And that highlights, again, the importance of model scope, um, how model scope depends on model purpose. Model purpose is used as a logical knife, as John Sturman says, to cut away unnecessary complexity. Um, okay, um, so I want to talk about these three modeling types. Um, uh, we're going to go through each of them in short order, and um, we're going to need to move quickly and carry a light load to finish, ladies and gentlemen, um, within, uh, within the hour. Okay, the first of them is, is system dynamics. Um, two forms of system dynamics modeling are actually depicted on the slide. The left, we're going to be concentrating on left, it, it, uh, less. Um, it's a uh, semi-qualitative tradition called causal loop diagram. It's very important uh, in terms of how system dynamics is applied by some segment of the community. This course is about quantitative modeling, and uh, it hews more to the, to the rightmost uh, image, which depicts stocks and flows, uh, building blocks you'll see in a in a few minutes here. So what is system dynamics? Well, system dynamics, um, compared to the other traditions to a degree, um, it, it's perhaps most distinctive in building in a philosophy of modeling, a perspective on the world, a very particular distance, as George Richardson says, um, in, in, in analyzing the world. Um, uh, it's, it's a perspective on things. It, it has a perspective that's feedback and accumulation oriented. Um, and it's a broad and, and indeed over time evolving methodology, sometimes less slowly evolving than I'd like, to conceptualize, describe, analyze, and manage feedback systems. And it's very much geared towards managing these systems. Um, um, it's not a spectator sport. Um, it encourages use of models to make better decisions. Um, and, uh, and, and as such, um, uh, they, they tend towards an action-oriented uh, philosophy. Um, so system dynamics offers qualitative and quantitative components. We're going to focus on the latter. Um, uh, there's a modeling process. This is better match, mapped out as a conscious process uh, compared to, to other disciplines. And it really has tended to emphasize work with stakeholders directly. But it has, and we're going to emphasize this a lot in the class, a very rigorous mathematical foundation that is used heavily by the cognate tradition of what's called compartmental modeling. Um, and really, uh, these use the same mathematical formalisms, uh, differences more in, in philosophy and in history. Um, 
Uh, and because it is mathematically based, it has access to this rich set of analysis uh, tools uh, that can be used by it. Um, and software um, within this area has long, since the 1980s, uh, the, the pioneering work of Perry Richmond and others, focused on what is being described, less how. It's, it's less um, low level in its specification of models uh, than, um, than agent-based modeling, for example, traditionally, or discrete event simulation. Um, it seeks to use a declarative approach to say, look, this is the system structure, and the software takes care of the details about exactly how to simulate it, okay? Um, so um, it tends to focus on, on broadening people's mental models, their sort of narrow views of the situation, to take into account a broader set of effects and improving decision making. Um, uh, I talked last time about modeling as, as kind of a, a tied up with, with learning and evolving one's mental model and, and undertaking action in the world and observing the results or looking at empirical data as part of that, but also as creating models, getting feedback on them, running them, getting feedback on that from system stakeholders and refining the mental model further. This is very much a system dynamics sort of perspective on things um, with the centrality of the mental model being, being a key focus for system dynamics. Okay, so system dynamics tends to focus on feedbacks. These cases where A influences B and then B influences A. Um, you know, I, I, I have a certain weight. Maybe I make efforts to lose weight. Um, I uh, go on a diet. I restrict my food intake. And then my body, the way these things work, we build systems of these, um, you know, uh, lowers its uh, it, sensing that it's it's being uh, starved, it's being um, it's it's getting less energy and reduces its me metabolic rate, and that makes it harder to lose weight, and so that ends up influencing my weight again, and that's a feedback. Uh, or at the most prosaic level, you know, I'm I'm getting hungry. And I'm going to eat some, you know, spicy mushrooms. Um, uh, so, and that will reduce my hunger. So these are feedbacks. Um, but the other key component of it, besides feedbacks, is accumulations. Um, and accumulations are central in system dynamics and represented by, uh, by stocks. We'll see this in a minute. Um, uh, a lot of system dynamics models are designed to welcome stakeholder participation. And it is applied at a, at a different levels of granularity. We're going to focus in this course mostly at, a, at an aggregate level, but it, it can be applied. And we've done lots of application of it at, at the level, say, of particular individual people. Um, so I mentioned there's qualitative models. There's models at different levels. Uh, qualitative models are, are broadly used and, and really are engaged in um, sets of stakeholders, with sets of stakeholders. And this approach is being adopted by other techniques of dynamic modeling in more recent years, in part with our um, um, continued push in that direction uh, in, in helping to, uh, to drive that trend. Um, okay, so uh, system dynamics at a qualitative level uh, uh, can be used to, to, to illustrate interactions between sets of factors in a non-quantitative way, in a qualitative way. And there is, there is some quantitative um, underpinning for this at a certain level. And, um, and these, these are partial derivatives for those who don't recognize them. But um, here uh, we depict it at a high level with a causal loop diagram. If my hunger goes up, it tends to lead me to, to eat more food. I'm going to, you know, eat a, a cliff bar. Um, uh, and, uh, and that will then tend to reduce, that's the negative side, my hunger. Okay. Um, you'll find videos of me explicating this for one or two lectures in a row, um, in other renditions of this course or courses at University of Michigan or elsewhere. Um, I'm not going to go through that now other than to expose you very briefly to this and say we are not taking it on this term because we have too many fish to fry, okay? Um, so uh, we have two types of loops here. Some are negative feedback loops, also called uh, balancing loops, where collectively you could take the product of these signs 
um, you get a, uh, by the rule of signs, a minus times a positive is a minus. Um, and that tends to be balancing. It tends to be self-stabilizing uh, if the delay is not long. And you could see some uh, balancing loops here. Um, you know, the emergency department has a long queue. You've probably been in this situation before. Um, you wait for a long time and you say, I may get more sick just waiting here than I am, you know, than my complaint um, uh, is, uh, you know, the severity of my complaint. So I'm going to leave. And you leave, and guess what? The queue in the emergency room goes down. Um, so uh, this is a, a balancing loop. And hopefully in life, it's a key uh, fact, a key element of, of, of uh, life commitment, we make mistakes and we're honest about learning from those mistakes, and that lowers the chance of making mistakes in the future. Um, uh, these are examples of regulating feedbacks, and um, there's positive feedbacks which tend to spiral away, such as, the more infected people there are, the more new people get infected, and that leads to even more infected people. And I, I had by my druthers in a few more minutes, I would have added some diagrams for that. You'll find lots of talking head videos of me talking about that elsewhere. In most of the case, I'm not even a talking head. It's just a screen, uh, a screencast, so you don't even have to um, endure the insult, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of my appearance. Okay, um... But our focus this term is on quantitative system dynamics. Um, and the heart of this are two building blocks, also highly testable. Um, number one, stocks. Number two, flows. These are flows here, and these are stocks here, shown as boxes. Stocks are also called levels. They're called state variables. They're called compartments in different subquarters of modeling space more generally. In system dynamics, they're called stocks, but there's cognate traditions like compartmental modeling, uh, which call them state variables um, or, or call them uh, compartments uh, when applied, say, at a population level. Okay, so stocks, these, these boxes, this is a quantitative diagram. It has precise semantics associated with it that allow you, that are precise enough to allow you to simulate it. Because remember what I said last time, models are useful to, to get us thinking about the world and, and we get stakeholders to critique them and, and we get our thinking in line and we more quickly are disabused of our, our misunderstandings about the system. They take things trapped in our heads, put it out there in the world for critique and refinement. And that's all good, but models only go so far. To really gain insight from those models more deeply, we need to be able to simulate them. They need to be precise enough to allow us to, to say what figure, you know, like go figure, you, you know, what's the implications of this logically over time? That's what Einstein can't do in his head, um, is, is think through in a nonlinear system, how is this going to behave? So we need to lend these things uh, semantics enough, precise meaning enough that we can simulate it. So stocks represent accumulations here. They represent the state of the system. We're going to come back and deal with this many lectures, so I'm not going to go into it. But basically, they can be measured at any instant in time. You could count, say, count the number of people in the emergency room waiting or count the number of people who are staying overnight in the hospital or uh, count the amount of water in your bath or count the amount of water in your bath. Um, yeah, I guess you could do it based on molecular uh, level uh, in, you know, measurement, but... Um, measure the amount of water in your bathtub as a continuous quantity. Um, stocks start with an initial value. And after all, after that, they're going to be driven purely by flows. Okay. Um, but collectively, they define the state of the system. They define what is the case now. Because remember I said, for dynamic, dynamic modeling in general, including for system dynamics modeling, what will happen the next little bit depends on what is the case now. And stocks characterize, the set of all stocks for a system characterizes what is the case now, okay? Um, so they dictate the state of the system and they lead to disequilibrium, a kind of transient phenomena which die out over time. or uh, They lead to, to oscillations and delays, etc. But the other major building block beyond stocks are flows. Flows represent the verbs compared to stocks representing the nouns. You can kind of think about it that. Ver the, the verbs, the, the flows, 
represent the change in the system. They're the action. They're things that are happening. The, the stocks are kind of what is the case now. The flows are how is it changing over time? Um, they, they represent rates of change. You know, how many new people are coming into the emergency room now? Or how quickly is new stress uh, building up in me compared to how, how effective am I in reducing my existing stress? Um, so so uh, we have flows representing changes. You know, number of people being discharged in the past day from the hospital. That can be characterized as rate. 100 people per day or, you know, 30 people per day being admitted. Um, these are flows. The stock could be how many people are in the hospital now. We could measure it at any one point. Um, flows, you, you measure over time. Um, uh, so, you know, in, in uh, diagrams like this, we, we characterize flows by these kind of pipes with valves on them. That's a stylized valve. And uh, they connect stocks. They drive stocks. Stocks only change by virtue of the flows. In and the flows out. And um, how a stock changes depends on the net flow in minus some of in minus some of out. We're going to see this all in spades. Uh, but each of the flows has a formula associated with it that specifies exactly how did the number of people completing latency for flu depend on the number of people who are so-called exposed, the, the people who are infected but not yet infective in the latent period. How does the number of people recovering depend on the people who are infective now in the infectious period, the, the length of time for which people are infectious? So we put in formulae for these, okay? Um, so here we have this kind of duality where flows dictate changes in stocks, and if you didn't notice it, the value of a flow is dictated by, in, in many cases, by the value of a stock, okay? So here, the number... There won't be any recoveries unless there's someone infective. There won't be any new infections unless there is both someone infected, someone to do the infection, and somebody to be infected, somebody susceptible. So infection here depends on uh, susceptibles and infectives. Again, going back to that rubric, going back to that mantra, in a dynamic system, what can happen the next little bit depends on what is the case now. What is the case now is summarized by the stock. So it's no surprise that, you know, what happens in the next little bit, like how many people are infected is summarized by this flow or how many people recover is summarized by that one depends on the current state of the system, infectives or susceptibles and infectives for the case of new infection. Okay. Um, Okay, capturing heterogeneity is a is a tricky thing with these these models. Okay, with with system dynamics aggregate models, often we want to cal uh, capture the fact that people are different. Look, with COVID nineteen, your risk of developing severe complications is orders of magnitude different. If you're the age of many of the people watching this uh, video from class, versus if you're someone in the oldest age groups, 80, 90. Um, and it goes up by successive ages. Um, it's, uh, the, the chance of dying from COVID is actually quite different for men and women um, if you have uh, uh, severe symptoms. Um, uh, excuse me, if you're, if you're symptomatic, it's, it's different. Um, uh, there's real differences in how, um, how there's, there's uh, transmission in different communities, uh, for example, reflecting crowded housing and, and other so-called social determinants of health. So the world around us is filled with heterogeneity. It's filled with differences between people. And every modeling type has a way of trying to represent that. Um, this is handled a little bit more awkwardly in aggregate system dynamics models because there's this combinatorial explosion. If you, if you want to take into account age, you want to take into account someone's housing situation, you want to take into account someone's sex, you want to take into account uh, aspects of what chronic diseases they have. Um, it kind of blows up. And, and why is that? It's because rather than having a model like this where we have some stock representing the number of infected people, we have to kind of break it out for how many infected people are there in the zero to four age category? How many infected people are there in the five through nine age category? How many infected people are there in the 10 through 14? 
Now imagine doing that where you have to do, how many infected people are there? Zero to four females, low income. Zero to four females, high income. Zero to four males, low income. Zero to four uh, males, uh, high income, etc. It gets combinatorial. You get all combinations, and it's, it, it, it's awkward. Um, if you have to do this on a geographic level, as we are called for, we, you know, our models for the province um, for asking what if questions involving COVID-19 uh, represent every community in Saskatchewan. And um, we, we often will think about different policies or, or different interventions for, for different areas of the province. Think about our north compared to the urban areas, for example. Um, and here, um, trying to represent geography within an aggregate system dynamics model is, is, is very uh, challenging. But all of these models exhibit emergent behavior. And the whole is greater than the sum of the parts here in that the behavior of the whole, like the number of infective people in the system over time, um, uh, the total number of infectives across the population, is, is some nonlinear function over time of, of these pieces. And so you get a behavior for the whole, which you can't reduce to any one piece. After all, if you tried to reduce the number of infectives, you'd be ignoring the number of susceptibles. And it, you can't, can't do that. Guess what? It takes two to tango. You need an infective and a susceptible to get a new infection. So you can't reduce the number of susceptibles either. They're entangled. They're, they're, they're you know, um, intertwined in a way that is most uh, troubling. Um, for decision making and um, for for policy response in this case, um, and this leads to really interesting behavior. Tipping points: vaccinate one more person, and 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 you know, COVID nineteen may not be able to effectively spread in the population. Uh, not now, by the way. <laughs> Think this summer um, or or early fall if w w our vaccination induced immunity isn't waning too quickly. Um, uh, there's lock-in effects where if we don't intervene early, we can, the system can be so out of whack, picking up the pieces is much more expensive than if we had just dealt with it up front. Um, think about early interventions in childhood to prevent childhood traumatic, uh, traumatic events or, or uh, to invest in childhood education and safe environments for kids, for example. Um, uh, all these things are... Um, uh, you know, can emerge from system dynamics models. So the key thing, one of the key things we're going to be talking about this semester is these system dynamics models, they're designed to be presented in a way that's approachable, that you could take a stakeholder, sit them in front of a model, and they could give feedback and say, you know, this doesn't cut it. You need to represent a asymptomatic pathway because, you know, here you're not capturing the fact that a large fraction of COVID patients, about 40% overall, varies by age, um, never have symptoms, um, but they are infectious. You also are missing a, a, a stock where, which represents the fact that people, when they're initially infectious, they're not infective. This is a, a thing a stakeholder can do based on a model depiction like this. But often to analyze it and to use it with machine learning algorithms and so on, we need to unpack it. We give nice short names for things, and we write down what, uh, differential equations for it. So what this is saying is the rate of change of the number of susceptibles is given by some rate of inflow, M, um, minus some rate of outflow, which collectively is C times I times, excuse me, C times beta times I over N, okay? Um, and then times the number of susceptibles. Um, this is called the force of infection, and, and then we, that's the chance per day is susceptible to be infected. We multiply by the number of susceptibles. And this flow that's shown as one sort of monolithic thing here turns into two of these uh, terms in this equation. And, and this flow turns into two of these. We're going to be doing a lot of work with these differential equations. We're going to be analyzing the equilibria point. We'll be talking about the critical vaccination fraction, et cetera. And these differential equations, the capacity to turn a model like this, which is great for communicating with stakeholders into something quantitative, is not to be underestimated. In our machine learning algorithms can take advantage of this as well. Okay, so formal analytics of these models is very powerful. It's something that goes on a lot in my lab, the Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab. And 
um, it it really can draw on the fact that mathematics understanding stocks and flows is very well defined. It's well understood. We know since Newton's time and Leibniz's time how to how to reason about these sort of systems. Um, in this case, it's nonlinear because you have an I times an S term, incidentally. You can't get infection without infectives and susceptibles. Um, and you need a term which depends on both rather than just depending linearly like this term, I over mu, on, on just one thing. Um, I'm throwing some tidbits for those who are keeners, okay? Um, so analysis of these models can provide all sorts of insight, and we'll be spending time on that. The long-term behavior, the stability of the system. You know, suppose we have three infected people flying in from Cancun to Saskatoon next fall. Is everything going to go to hell in a handbasket in a couple of weeks, or is it stable? Have we, have we built a system that can resist perturbation, much as, you know, uh, this uh, piece of paper resists being pulled apart um and how far can we go you know i'm pulling this apart it's elastic right now it pulls back but at some point ladies and gentlemen it breaks um and when does it go inelastic um uh what feedback loops and causal links are are dominating the behavior right now what's driving the behavior um uh and it turns out that this can feed into machine learning algorithms like particle filtering or particle mcmc that can kind of correct a model over time based on observations and help it better grounded as to what's going on. And it kind of balances noisy data. Um, Eric and Aaron know all about that. And fallible model uh, predictions, okay, um, for, for what's going to happen. And, and the model's uh, going to be off base sometimes. The data's going to be incomplete and, and noisy and, and problematic. And this kind of balances them to get a distribution. Um, that's a lot of uh, what we do in our lab. Um, okay, so system dynamics, notable strengths. We have to move on to other traditions here. Um, it allows us to capture dynamics of continuous variables, allows really quick model prototyping, support for participatory modeling. That's all I'm going to say on that on this, uh, this um, semester. Um, and, uh, you know, people can work with the models without being mathematicians, but it has this really nice instantiation in mathematical terms for formal analysis for those who have the requisite training. And you, dear viewers, will soon have some measure of that training to enjoy yourselves. Um, and um, it, it can also provide really strong support for intuition building how to decide things better. Okay, so that's one type of modeling, very popular, dates from the 1950s, the work of Jay Forrester at MIT, um, uh, a father of, of cybernetics, and then at the Sloan School of Management for many years. Um, uh, Agent-based modeling is the next major tradition we're going to talk about. Agent-based modeling has a characterization that in some sense is orthogonal to, is at right angles to, system dynamics in how it characterizes a system. It's a somewhat more recent tradition, although it goes back to some degree to the um, seminal work of, of uh, uh, von Neumann, who some of you may know from his contributions to computer architecture, an eminent mathematician of Hungarian descent who, who really influenced mathematics across many disciplines, computer science, uh, mathematical uh, uh, mathematical epidemiology for, for this sort of simulation, but also also in economics. So in age-based models, our, our point of focus is uh, typically lower level than system dynamics. System dynamics, we count the number of people who are infective. They're, people aren't represented as individuals. It, it depicts at any point right now how many people are infected, but we don't keep track of, is that the same person who is over there? three step time, time units earlier, um, we gloss o over that. But in age-based modeling, we follow populations at the level of individuals. Often these are people, but it could be vials of vaccine. It, it could be, you know, tests being run in the Prov lab in the, the Roy Romano Provincial Lab for COVID-19. Um, it might be um, community organizations in other cases, or service dogs, um, uh, Tasmanian devils. Um, 
so so don't always think they're they're people um but that's that's a often often a use in my neck of the woods uh so we have populations composed of individual agents and we call them agents they're sometimes called actors informally etc and each of them is associated with a set of things um you'll learn more about um a, a, a more fine-grained way of characterizing this but parameters boy would this, this might be nice to kind of test this at some point you know give give three things associated with each agent um parameters they have parameters some some fixed assumptions about a given agent state that's their current situation the current um the current situation for that agent what 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 is the case for them right now actions that they can undertake to change the situation and rules under which those actions apply okay maybe maybe i can become infected but only when another agent exposes me to COVID 19. Mm-hmm. um i can become infected and mechanistically in an agent-based model will capture that through something called mass message passing it, it sends a message to me and says thou have has been exposed thou help thou, thou, thou has okay that doesn't sound right my, my old english is failing me um uh, uh so rules for evolving the state under which those actions are triggered actions trigger change rules say under what actions under what situations do those uh, actions fire do they are they triggered um and then there's a means of interacting with other agents through what's typically called an environment remember that example of the traffic jam um cars can interact with each other right i slow down because the person right ahead of me is slowing down and i see their taillights or what have you um but I also slow down because the roadway looks very slick and, you know, it's a narrow part of the road. So they might depend on sort of spatial context. There's a time horizon associated with these models um, and uh, some characteristics associated with that. Um, some agent-based modeling traditions have discrete time steps. Simulate day one, day two, day three. Others have continuous time. Things happen as frequently as they need to or as slowly as they need to with punctuated change followed by periods of stasis. Um, uh, and there's some initial state of the system. Um, okay, oh, this didn't, oh man. Um, sorry for the um, extra insults. Uh, this is horrible. I ended up not using PowerPoint to display this. I put it onto a PDF and I, thought I was safe, alas. Um, okay, here's the deal. Um, we'll see this more, but aggregate system dynamics models, they basically subdivide. Remember, to capture heterogeneity, we divide the popula- population up into categories. We have a separate box, a separate stock for people, say, who are male and infected versus female who are infected. Or if you start considering more things, male and this age group, uh, versus male in that age group versus female in this age group and fe- uh, female in that age group. We subdivide it up. We create separate stocks. It, it's organized by state and characteristics um, of, of those uh, considered. And each stock counts the number of people who are in that situation. Okay. Um, and um, that's, so we organize the model by characteristics and state um that's how it's organized and and for each of those we count an a, a count of how many people or how many agents how many actors or how many how many things are in that state okay um with agent-based modeling we're subdividing it we organize the model by by the agents by the by the actors in it um uh, we have these constituent actors who are all around, one of them for each person in the population. And our population for COVID-19 in the, in the province is has an agent for each of you. It's not labeled with your name. It doesn't know about your characteristics, but there's one for each person in the, in the overall population, um, distributed by age and sex and so on, kind of similar to you. Uh, actually, sex is, is, is not well captured by that. Um, geography, et cetera. Um, but each of these units, so we organize it by agents, but each unit maintains its own state, maintains its own characteristics. So again, stock and flow, 
organize it by characteristics, the model, and we count the number that have that characteristic, agent-based modeling organized by agents, and each of those counts, uh, uh, keeps track of its state and its, uh, its characteristics. And then we put them in, in kind of a networks or geographic space so they can interact. So look, in the model, we, I mean, this should be fairly clear to you as computer scientists. After all, you've gone through and defined programs, compiled them, and run them before. Um, although you may have started with interpreted, interpreted languages like Python. Um, you've you've uh, seen now statically compiled languages like, like Java. And so you, you declare, you know, there's this, um, this population when you design a model. And then at runtime, when you're simulating the model, it's, there's a whole bunch of people in that population, maybe 1.1 million for, for Saskatchewan. Maybe it's, um, you know, uh, 300,000 or so for Saskatoon. Maybe it's, um, you know, 50 or so for this class. There's one person for each person that that population there. And each of these people has lent characteristics. So each of these people has um, defined for it a set of characteristics. You could almost think about them as fields in a Java class or something like that. So they'll have an ethnicity, they'll have a sex and an income perhaps. And each person at runtime is given a particular values for those, right? Um, and uh, our population will, will consist of those. At, at designing the model, we specify what the characteristics are. And then at runtime, when we're simulating the model, you have populations of people, each of whom has very particular characteristics. And over time, some of those will change because they're elements of state. Um, these were elements uh, that might be assumed to be fixed for the duration of the simulation, um, although some people's incomes have been modified. Um, State, uh, by contrast, is something that's changing over time. And, and you know, you might, um, you might change whether someone is pregnant or not, or whether they're susceptible or exposed, infective or recovered, what their level of COVID-19 symptomology is, uh, whether they're in the hospital or not, are they open to seeking care or not, or what have you. Um, these, these things are defined in different ways. Sometimes we define a simple variable, particularly if it's continuous, of a quantity like income that might change over time or age. We, we might define a continuous way, um, weight, um, height. We might define these continuously. We can't do that in an aggregate system dynamics model. All we can do is divide things up into buckets. Here we can actually define it in a, on a continuous level. We could remember someone's birth weight or we could have their current weight evolving. Um, but often we define higher level constructs like these state charts. And you folks might have seen state charts in CMPT 270 at one point. Um, uh, but, but here we have um, a formalism that actually addresses several of these things here. It specifies what the states are, possible states with respect to a particular concern here, fertility, here are things with infection, for example, here care seeking. So it specifies those states. It specifies the rules for evolving the, the excuse me, where, where are the actions? Oh my gosh, uh, should have actions, oh my gosh. Okay, um, so th it specifies the actions, the things that can change the state by which someone might, for example, um, uh, give birth and, and go from pregnant to non-pregnant, or someone might recover and go from infective to recovered, or someone might lose immunity and go from recovered back to susceptible. Those are actions, but it also specifies, and you'll see these little icons and you'll learn to, to use them and hopefully to love them, perhaps some to hate them. Um, these specify the rules under which this action is, is, is fired, under what conditions you're gonna have your immunity wane. It's probably gonna be a big issue, ladies and gentlemen, in coming months, uh, well, in the next uh, half year to, to year, but it's going to be an even bigger issue for COVID-19 in coming years uh, because vaccine-induced immunity wanes and natural immunity wanes. And uh, we're going to probably see something more similar to COVID-19 becoming like seasonal um, infection. Um, uh, and 
And here, you know, this this uh, action of going from recovered to susceptible with respect to the concerns indicated by the state chart, that is fired under certain circumstances. Someone only gets exposed, only gets exposed to the bug um, uh, and, and and infected by it, but not yet infective by virtue of interaction with others. OK, um, Time is moving on, um, and so must I here. Um, so uh, a, another key component for agent-based modeling is a mean, needing a means of interacting with other agents or the broader environment. Think, cars in a traffic jam react to cars in front of them, um, but they also might react to the slickness of the road, uh, the fact that we had freezing rain last night, the width of the road, the degree of visibility around that turn coming up. Um, and uh, here in agent-based modeling, we have different ways of capturing these effects of context, okay? Um, there's a cognate tradition in, in, um, uh, in health sciences and, and actually more broadly than that um, in philosophy called critical realism. And it, it talks about context mechanism outcome. And, and really dynamic modeling, uh, and particularly agent-based modeling, captures all of those really nicely. And context here can be uh, connectivity-wise. Um, th this is captured by networks frequently. I have um, connectivity with one or more people. It's the topology of the situation, what's connected to what. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> we may see behavior, but um, I should really say that sometimes it's geographic. Um, this from a model of West, no excuse me, of, of chronic wasting disease in this province. These, in case you don't recognize them, are deer um, uh, circulating, some of whom are infective, some of whom are newly infective, some of whom are critically infective, and they're dropping prions, these misfolded proteins, in their environment. Um, and they tend to cluster in areas where the deer um, tend to... Uh, uh, tend to need to go. Um, horrible English, I apologize. But um, uh, one area that deer will often go is, 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 is in, in, um, in terms of uh, uh, water seeking. And so they'll make their way to a lakeside margin. And it's not that any one of these places has, you know, the special grass or something, but they just go to the lakeside margin in relation to other areas so much more frequently. They drop a lot of prions there. Um, and, uh, and this leads to other deer being exposed when they're in that region as well. Um, so uh, here we have deer circulating in a geographic environment. And in ABMs, we can capture this geographic situation of agents. We place them in a certain town in Saskatchewan, and then they go to farmers markets in other towns, uh, for example, to sell their produce. Um, that's part of our COVID-19 modeling or um, you know, people seek care from the far north or flown to Saskatoon for for um, uh, critical care, for example. Um, and we can capture that behavior geographically very nicely within these models. But sometimes we just want to capture it at a more stylized model, a stylized level in terms of networks. Um, uh, OK, um, so with ABMs, this is an important point. With, with system dynamics models, aggregate system dynamics models, we capture emergent behavior in terms of the behavior of the whole of the system over time, certain variables that summarize the system over time. Um, and it's emergent because you can't predict it from the behavior of any one piece of the system or knowing about the, the rules by which that piece operates. So that's the behavior over time of the system as a whole. With ABMs, because we have context, um, networks, we have uh, geographic context, we can do something richer than that. We can look at emergent behavior in space at any one time. And this is an example of the emergent behavior. We had system dynamics models of chronic waste and disease before this model was built in this very class, I might add, by a project, a student project team. Um, and, um, and when we ran this, it was just like, you know, it was a real eye opener. I didn't expect these patterns, but they came and struck me, you know, um, very forcibly um, because they illustrate emergence spatially that I hadn't known to anticipate. I, I didn't know it would be, you know, that 
keenly concentrated around the lake margins, lake shore regions, and that a large fraction of the deer would end up getting infected there. Um, and you can get spatial dynamics of other interesting uh, sorts within these models. Due to very localized phenomena, you get these really interesting patterns that result like waves of infection. Okay. Um, uh, and, you know, you can get behavior over networks over time that as, as phenomena spread over the, the network. Now, one thing I, I didn't concentrate on was system dynamics. System dynamics is traditionally practiced, not universally. Um, there's many particular exceptions um, whereby people have created stochastic models in system dynamics, these, I say, aggregate models of a population. But with uh, agent-based modeling, um, system dynamics in general tends to be deterministic. What does that mean? Well, it means that, remember, dynamical systems in general, what happens in the next little bit depends on what is currently the case. And in traditional system dynamics modeling, in these uh, deterministic models, what happens in the next little bit, ladies and gentlemen, um, is totally determined by what is the case now. It's, it's completely defined. By that. There's no stochastics. There's no uncertainty. There's no, you know, um, variability. It's just it, the system will go like this. It's like, you know, you unplug the plug to your to your bathtub after it's you take a bath and the water will go down at a very regular rate. And it's not a lot of variability uh, there between um, if you have the bath filled to the exact same level multiple times, it's going to go down basically the same amount of time. Um, but in a lot of systems, it's more variable than that. Um, even things like behavior, whether someone shows up to, you know, with some mild symptoms to get tested, um, whether someone happens to, to run into that infected person when shopping or when in the classroom, um, um, whether they happen to accept an invitation to an ill-begotten family gathering um, over the holidays, um, whether Uncle Joe makes it to that gathering because he's feeling under the weather. Um, there's a lot of stochastics in human behavior. Um, we like to pride ourselves perhaps sometimes uh, as, as rational actors, but in fact, there's a lot of, of variability. Um, and ABMs reflective of this are typically stochastic. There are exceptions. We'll see some stylized ones like the Game of Life that are not, but uh, by and large, um, they are stochastic. Um, we're simulating things at a fine enough level. You, you need stochastics typically to, to characterize the phenomena uh, plausibly. And that's an asset because we could look at data from the world and, and try to understand why is it so variable, for example. Um, so one of the consequences of this, so, so it's an asset, but it has consequences. And one of the consequences is that there's a computational burden that's exacted because of this, okay? Um, for anyone falling asleep, that should uh, help. Um, so uh, to ensure that if, if, if what we're running at any one time with the model, the model results we get, if, if that's determined by stochastics, how do we know the interesting patterns that come out? Something like this or something like that is not a fluke. How do we know it's not just chance it, it you know it doesn't have to be that it it just we happen to see it this time but maybe the next time the prions are all concentrated in this lower area of the space how do we know well one way to know it, it's kind of um it's it's the typical way is we run it many many times we run a so-called ensemble of these realizations each realization is a certain pattern of stochastics and we run it again and again and again and again. It's called Monte Carlo. It's like spinning the roulette wheel in the Monte Carlo Casino in, in um, I think it's a principality or something in Europe. Um, and you do it again and again. And, and eventually through the law of large numbers, you get, you know, you get patterns which have some variability, but often have some central tendency, some, some certain regularity, certain orderliness that, that holds over that. And it's striking because these are dynamic models. They have structure. And when you have structure in the dynamic models, it tends to lead to 
some regular patterns and some variability around them. And knowing about both is very important. Um, and so our results for the province with COVID-19, we give the variability, how, how bad it could get. And if you're planning emergency room operations, you're planning the number of you know, ICU triage teams to have, to have on there, et cetera, you, you need to be ready for that variability. Um, but at the same time, you want to know, you know, roughly um, our, our, what level of, of demand are we going to need so you can set expectations properly for the most, most likely case. Um, you just don't want to predicate everything on that that being the case. And, and um and so you have to run these models many times. Um, the stochastics are an asset. So any given run might give a certain set of results. So this, this orange, for example, um, is not the orange-haired menace in the White House, but rather a, a certain set of results for a low SES population and high SES population. And um, this is for a given run of the simulation. We have a number of cases over time that rise and a number of um, uh, that in low income versus high, and you can see there's, uh, there's a, a di uh, distressing disparity between the two. But if you run the model many times, um, each time you might get some variability, you might see a distribution for this orange uh, result. The low SES cases sometimes fall right within that range, but um, maybe about 35% of the time. But in other times, they, they can be somewhat lower than that. And oh my gosh, over 40% of the time, they're essentially zero. Um, and take a look at high SES cases. Um, they're variable. It's not all over the map. And there's a certain broad regularity that's evident here, which is look, and, and what's masked is uh, high SES is, uh, has a very large fraction of zero as well. You know, high SES people, high socioeconomic status people, people who are wealthy, um, tend to have a lot fewer cases than those are low SES. But there are some some cases where there's an exception. And similarly, in terms of how many cases we get, it can vary uh, from run to run, and we summarize it here. Okay, uh, I'm mindful of the time. Um, we're going to uh, put a move on, and we're going to finish up with the uh, final type of modeling. We've gone through system dynamics modeling stocks and flows, mathematical characterization, deterministic typically, difficulty representing heterogeneity in a scalable way, agent-based modeling, articulated at a finer grain level in terms of individuals can scale to capture heterogeneity very well because each individual can keep track of their characteristic just like a given class can have many fields in it. Each person can keep track of what their sex is, what their age is in a continuous way, what their income level is, where they live. You can place them in space. And you can have many types of concerns evolving over time. Discrete event modeling um, is like agent-based modeling an individual level tradition. Um, we articulate people at the level of people or, or vials of vaccine or tests or records for contact tracing at an individual level. However, it's much more structured and constrained as typically practiced than agent-based modeling. This is not a matter of, of um, computational universality. For anyone who's taken the course on... Um, uh, computability. Uh, we'll, we'll know that um, things can be Turing complete as languages. And just as in Perl, we could write a Turing machine. In any of these frameworks, we could actually simulate the other frameworks. But it would be brutal, typically, to do so. And with discrete event modeling, we have a, a more constrained tradition. And it's really, really, really good. Really. Um, at characterizing structured workflows, okay? So we have a set of processes that we characterize in some structured way. It's not necessarily in a straight line. We can have branch points and loops and so on. Um, but we characterize how a given individual agent, typically it's called entity in discrete event simulation, progresses down this. Think about the process by which someone goes into the hospital um, 
and, and they get worked up. They get examined and, and decisions are made with them. That's one of the thing, one frag, fragment of which is depicted here. So they may undergo a CAT scan, for example, but before that they have to drink some trace, med, um, uh, trace, uh, trace meds or, or, or trace bolus that they eat in order to illuminate their, uh, their system um, with slightly radioactive um, tracers. Or they undergo a VQ scan for a pulmonary embolism or, or an ultrasound scan, um, depending whether or not it's needed or that may be bypassed. Um, so here we have a, a workflow. We have a structured characterization of sort of steps and, and, and rules under which different steps are undertaken. And what's critical here is these entities progress down this. They, they flow down this workflow. And their progress down the workflow is resource constrained. So they'll, they'll get stuck at certain points. They'll queue up at certain points. They'll wait at certain points, depending on whether or not a resource is available. Okay? Um, uh, so depending on whether or not the VQ scan is, is currently available, they may wait for the VQ scan or whether the CAT scan is available. Um, they may wait for a, a doctor to become available. A, you know, maybe it's a specialist physician for pulmonology, um, respirology here in, the, in Canada. And, um, and their progress down there is dependent, therefore, on those resources. Um, in contrast to agent-based modeling, they don't really tend to interact, the entities, these agents, that much. Um, agent-based modeling, the focus is on agent-agent interaction and agent-environment interaction. Um, that's a key part of it. In discrete event simulation, one agent or entity does influence another, but it's predominantly, traditionally, through keeping that other one waiting because the resource isn't available. So you get queues forming here, lines for the VQ scan, lines to get tested for COVID, lines to, to be contact traced. You know, you're, you're, you're you're, you're, you're a contact, and the case that had contact with you maybe was found, you know, five days ago, but they only give you a call five days later because they're working through the queue. Um, uh, the entities flow through here. The processes operate upon them, but there's kind of less autonomy than back here with agent-based modeling, where the agents are kind of flowing through as active entities. They they expose other people, that's the message here, and they are exposed by others. Rather, um, here it's kind of put through the, the workflow, and, and um, we have these flow charts to ca characterize it. And a key need and key motivation is to look at the impact of resources on flow. So suppose we add double the number of um, ventilators, for example, for our ICUs provincially. How much would that help? And you might think, well, it's obvious it would help a great deal if we had, you know, very sick COVID-19 patients. But think about it this way. Um, in order to run those ventilators, you need trained nurses, who are not just any old nurse, they're trained in ICU care. And you need physicians that are paired with those nurses. You need whole teams and those teams have to be on schedule at that time at that particular ICU, not you know in, in one in North Battleford or, or, or Regina. So here you, you might have pools of resources, and a lot of the interest is, you know, how much could we reduce the waiting if we could increase these resources? How much would it help to add to resources here, add resources there? How much would it help to place those resources closer so they could be mobilized sooner? Um, to place them in different areas of the system. That's what you're often interested in here. Now, discrete event modeling has some extraordinary strengths. Each of these traditions has extraordinary expressiveness, capacity to characterize things when used in certain areas, areas of their focus, areas that stay true to the types of questions that are normal asked. And here, the questions are often ones about resource availability and resource level how much we, we should devote, how does that affect waiting time, how does it affect the length of the wait queue, et cetera. So discrete event modeling um, excels at representing resource limited uh, flow and processing of people in the context of limited resources. You know, this, this pipeline could be for creation of vaccines. We'd have a different pipeline for 
lab testing at the Roy Romanov Provincial Lab for COVID-19. We'd have another workflow for contact tracing. We have another workflow for admission to the hospital based on symptomology. Um, and all of these could have structured workflows and all of them will be impacted by resources, like the amount of testing potentially or the amount of number of contact tracers who are doing the, the tracing. Um, and through this sort of modeling, you have the capacity to identify the impact on, here it says health service availability, but it's really service availability. The ability to deliver services in a workflow like this based on level of resourcing, coordination between those resources, where they're placed, facility layout, you know, the design of RUH's wards, um, uh, the design of a long-term care facility, how does that impact things? And traditionally, this doesn't require as much programming as um, agent-based modeling, which is not itself huge amounts of programming. You're not building a system from ground up. You're not building an operating system. But, um, uh, but it's substantial, and it's a barrier to, to some practitioners to, who don't have computational background. So this is a, a discrete event diagram uh, from hospitals in, in um, Saskatoon, not for COVID, but, uh, but with respect to emergency room waiting times. So the final thing I'll say here, we have to finish up, is that um, in this class and in contemporary modeling, there's a growing interest in hybrid strategies. And our lab, it turns out, uh, is, is one of a, a set of leaders worldwide in applying these strategies. And you can combine these strategies. They're not solitudes. They're not totally independent of one another. They're not um, incompatible. You can combine them, even within the same model, in a tool like AnyLogic. Um, and this can allow you to, to examine some very flexible features of a system and examine interaction and change your lens based on your learning. What you might represent with agent-based modeling compared with system dynamics modeling might change as you learn certain areas of the system are more important. Okay, a couple key take-home messages so you can get a, a, a washroom break before the next class begins for you or before office hours begin. Um, a couple key take-home messages. Number one, dynamic models express dynamic hypotheses about processes underlying observed behavior. That's true for all these types of tradition. We posit there are these processes out there in the world that, you know, by which things happen in the world causally. What influences what influences what. The language by which we express it is different for those sorts of models, but all of them share that tradition. All of them share a depiction of the current situation and how it evolves over time for each of the traditions is predicated on, is based on, is dependent on what's currently the case. Um, we just use different languages for describing it. Rates and, 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 and flows and system dynamics you know, transitions and state charts and events firing and, and agent-based modeling, cues and, and, you know, waiting times within discrete event simulation. Models like this help us, you know, reason about um, how uh, diverse factors uh, yield observed patterns, um, in this case for COVID-19 uh, related to, say, health disparities, and how interventions might affect these things, how, how trying to change the system, intervening, putting in place new public health orders, um, like should be announced tomorrow, um, might affect um, disparities. The models are specific to purpose, and the multiple modeling methodologies use different languages to offer complementary ways of describing these processes. And some of the greatest promise comes from hybrid approaches. What you're seeing with these three types is metalinguistic abstraction. We choose the language, and this is one of our privileges as computer scientists, let it never be forgotten. We choose the language to describe a situation so as to facilitate our characterization of the situation and a solution to the system. And here we can mix and match, uh, mix in and match languages in a tool like AnyLogic, hence its name, um, for a given model to describe a situation. I've given you in this brief time, a whirlwind glimpse of the three major sorts of modeling traditions, dynamic modeling traditions that will follow us through our, through our semester, ladies and gentlemen. All of them share the core characteristics talked about early on, on model scope, 
depicting state and the incremental changes in the state and depicting causal relationships. Um, and all of them, you have to choose what's endogenous, what's exogenous, and what's ignored. And with those remarks, I will close this session. And after a few uh, important minutes, I will uh, begin my office hours on this very channel. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'll look forward to, uh, to sharing with you some project ideas over the weekend. Um, and uh, bear in mind, these slides are up on Moodle. And I'll be posting additional slides and links to past renditions of the course where you can take a uh, secure or different perspective on some of the material. Thanks very much. It's been a privilege to be able to present this material. Oh, I'll stay here. Um, I, I'm not going to kick you out. Anyone who would like to stay for office hours may now do so. I will um, seek to stop the meeting, uh, or stop the recording so that office hours is, uh, is, is not subject to it. Thank you.